The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 1. Since it was the mother who fulfilled most of the parental functions, the family was at first, so far as we can pierce the mists of history, organized on the assumption that the position of the man in the family was superficial and incidental, while that of the woman was fundamental and supreme. In some existing tribes, and probably in the earliest human groups, the physiological role of the male in reproduction appears to have escaped notice quite as completely as among animals, who rut and mate and breed with happy unconsciousness of cause and effect. The Trobri and Islanders attribute pregnancy not to any commerce of the sexes, but to the entrance of a baloma, or ghost, into the woman. Usually the ghost enters while the woman is bathing. A fish has bitten me, the girl reports. When, says Malinowski, I asked who was the father of an illegitimate child, there was only one answer, that there was no father since the girl was unmarried. If, then, I asked, in quite plain terms, who was the physiological father, the question was not understood. The answer would be, it is a Baloma who gave her this child. These islanders had a strange belief that the Baloma would more readily enter a girl given to loose relations with men. Nevertheless, in choosing precautions against pregnancy, the girls preferred to avoid bathing at high tide rather than to forego relations with men. It is a delightful story which must have proved a great convenience in the embarrassing aftermath of generosity. It would be still more delightful if it had been invented for anthropologists as well as for husbands. In Melanesia, intercourse was recognized as the cause of pregnancy, but unmarried girls insisted on blaming some article in their diet. Even where the function of the male was understood, Sex relationships were so irregular that it was never a simple matter to determine the father. Consequently, the quite primitive mother seldom bothered to inquire into the paternity of her child. It belonged to her, and she belonged not to a husband, but to her father, or her brother, and the clan. It was with these that she remained, and these were the only male relatives whom her child would know. The bonds of affection between brother and sister were usually stronger than between husband and wife. The husband, in many cases, remained in the family and clan of his mother, and saw his wife only as a clandestine visitor. Even in classical civilization, the brother was dearer than the husband. It was her brother, not her husband, that the wife of Interfernes saved from the wrath of Darius. It was for her brother, not for her husband, that Antigone sacrificed herself. The notion that a man's wife is the nearest person in the world to him is a relatively modern notion, and one which is restricted to a comparatively small part of the human race. So slight is the relation between father and children in primitive society that in a great number of tribes the sexes live apart. In Australia and British New Guinea, in Africa and Micronesia, in Assam and Burma, among the Aleuts, Eskimos and Samoyeds, and here and there over the earth, tribes may still be found in which there is no visible family life. The men live apart from the women and visit them only now and then. Even the meals are taken separately. In northern Papua, it is not considered right for a man to be seen associating socially with a woman, even if she is the mother of his children. In Tahiti, family life is quite unknown. Out of this segregation of the sexes come those secret fraternities, usually of males, which appear everywhere among primitive races, and serve most often as a refuge against women. They resemble our modern fraternities in another point, their hierarchical organization. The simplest form of the family, then, was the woman and her children, living with her mother or her brother in the clan. Such an arrangement was a natural outgrowth of the animal family of the mother and her litter, and of the biological ignorance of primitive man. An alternative early form was matrilocal marriage. The husband left his clan and went to live with the clan and family of his wife, laboring for her or with her in the service of her parents. Descent in such cases was traced through the female line, and inheritance was through the mother. Sometimes even the kingship passed down through her rather than through the male. This mother right was not a matriarchate. It did not imply the rule of women over men. Even when property was transmitted through the woman, she had little power over it. She was used as a means of tracing relationships which, through primitive laxity or freedom, were otherwise obscure. It is true that in any system of society, the woman exercises a certain authority, rising naturally out of her importance in the home, out of her function as the dispenser of food, and out of the need that the male has of her and her power to refuse him. It is also true that there have been occasionally 
women rulers among some South African tribes, that in the Pelu Islands the chief did nothing of consequence without the advice of a council of elder women, that among the Iroquois the squaws had an equal right with the men of speaking and voting in the tribal council, and that among the Seneca Indians women held great power, even to the selection of the chief. But these are rare and exceptional cases. All in all, the position of women in early societies was one of subjection verging upon slavery. Her periodic disability, her unfamiliarity with weapons, the biological absorption of her strength in carrying, nursing, and rearing children handicapped her in the war of the sexes and doomed her to a subordinate status in all but the very lowest and the very highest societies. Nor was her position necessarily to rise with the development of civilization. It was destined to be lower in Periclean Greece than among the North American Indians. It was to rise and fall with her strategic importance rather than with the culture and morals of men. In the hunting stage, she did almost all the work except the actual capture of the game. In return for exposing himself to the hardships and risks of the chase, the male rested magnificently for the greater part of the year. The woman bore her children abundantly, reared them, kept the hut or home in repair, gathered food in woods and fields, cooked, cleaned, and made the clothing and the boots. Because the men, when the tribe moved, had to be ready at any moment to fight off attack, they carried nothing but their weapons. The women carried all the rest. Bushwomen were used as servants and beasts of burden. If they proved too weak to keep up with the march, they were abandoned. When the natives of the Lower Murray saw pack oxen, they thought that these were the wives of the whites. The differences in strength which now divide the sexes hardly existed in those days, and are now environmental rather than innate. Woman, apart from her biological disabilities, was almost the equal of man in stature, endurance, resourcefulness, and courage. She was not yet an ornament, a thing of beauty, or a sexual toy. She was a robust animal, able to perform arduous work for long hours and, if necessary, to fight to the death for her children or her clan. Women, said a chieftain of the Chippewas, are created for work. One of them can draw or carry as much as two men. They also pitch our tents, make our clothes, mend them, and keep us warm at night. We absolutely cannot get along without them on a journey. They do everything and cost only a little, for since they must be forever cooking, they can be satisfied in lean times by licking their fingers. Most economic advances in early society were made by the woman rather than the man. While for centuries he clung to his ancient ways of hunting and herding, she developed agriculture near the camp and those busy arts of the home which were to become the most important industries of later days. From the wool-bearing tree, as the Greeks called the cotton plant, the primitive woman rolled thread and made cotton cloth. It was she, apparently, who developed sewing, weaving, basketry, pottery, woodworking, and building. And in many cases it was she who carried on primitive trade. It was she who developed the home, slowly adding man to the list of her domesticated animals, and training him in those social dispositions and amenities which are the psychological basis and cement of civilization. But as agriculture became more complex and brought larger rewards, the stronger sex took more and more of it into its own hands. The growth of cattle breeding gave the man a new source of wealth, stability, and power. Even agriculture, which must have seemed so prosaic to the mighty nimrods of antiquity, was at last accepted by the wandering male, and the economic leadership which tillage had for a time given to women was wrested from them by the men. The application to agriculture of those very animals that woman had first domesticated led to her replacement by the male in the control of the fields. The advance from the hoe to the plow put a premium upon physical strength and enabled the man to assert his supremacy. The growth of transmissible property in cattle and in the products of the soil led to the sexual subordination of woman, for the male now demanded from her that fidelity which he thought would enable him to pass on his accumulations to children presumably his own. Gradually the man had his way. Fatherhood became recognized, and property began to descend through the male. Mother right yielded to father right, and the patriarchal family, with the oldest male at its head, became the economic, legal, political, and moral unit of society. The gods, who had been mostly feminine, became great bearded patriarchs, with such harems as ambitious men dreamed of in their solitude. This passage to the patriarchal, father-ruled family was fatal to the position of woman. In all essential aspects, she and her children became the property first of her father or oldest brother, then of her husband. She was bought in marriage precisely as a slave was bought in the market. She was bequeathed as property when her husband died, and in some places, New Guinea, the New Hebrides, the Solomon Islands, 
Fiji, India, etc., she was strangled and buried with her dead husband or was expected to commit suicide in order to attend upon him in the other world. The father had now the right to treat, give, sell, or lend his wives and daughters very much as he pleased, subject only to the social condemnation of other fathers exercising the same rights. While the male reserved the privilege of extending his sexual favors beyond his home, the woman, under patriarchal institutions, was vowed to complete chastity before marriage and complete fidelity after it. The double standard was born. The general subjection of woman which had existed in the hunting stage and had persisted in diminished form through the period of mother right became now more pronounced and merciless than before. In ancient Russia, on the marriage of a daughter, the father struck her gently with a whip and then presented the whip to the bridegroom as a sign that her beatings were now to come from a rejuvenated hand. Even the American Indians, among whom mother rights survived indefinitely, treated their women harshly, consigned to them all drudgery, and often called them dogs. Everywhere the life of a woman was considered cheaper than that of a man, and when girls were born there was none of the rejoicing that marked the coming of a male. Mothers sometimes destroyed their female children to keep them from misery. In Fiji, wives might be sold at pleasure, and the usual price was a musket. Among some tribes, man and wife did not sleep together, lest the breath of the woman should enfeeble the man. In Fiji, it was not thought proper for a man to sleep regularly at home. In New Caledonia, the wife slept in a shed while the man slept in the house. In Fiji, dogs were allowed in some of the temples, but women were excluded from all. Such exclusion of women from religious services survives in Islam to this day. Doubtless, woman enjoyed at all times the mastery that comes of long-continued speech. The men might be rebuffed, harangued, even now and then beaten. But all in all, the man was lord, the woman was servant. The Kafir bought women like slaves as a form of life income insurance. When he had a sufficient number of wives, he could rest for the remainder of his days. They would do all the work for him. Some tribes of ancient India reckoned the women of a family as part of the property inheritance, along with the domestic animals. Nor did the last commandment of Moses distinguish very clearly in this matter. Throughout Negro Africa, women hardly differed from slaves, except that they were expected to provide sexual as well as economic satisfaction. Marriage began as a form of the law of property, as a part of the institution of slavery. Chapter 4. The Moral Elements of Civilization since no society can exist without order, and no order without regulation, we may take it as a rule of history that the power of custom varies inversely as the multiplicity of laws, much as the power of instinct varies inversely as the multiplicity of thoughts. Some rules are necessary for the game of life. They may differ in different groups, but within the group they must be essentially the same. These rules may be conventions, customs, morals, or laws. Conventions are forms of behavior found expedient by a people. Customs are conventions accepted by successive generations, after natural selection through trial and error and elimination. Morals are such customs as the group considers vital to its welfare and development. In primitive societies, where there is no written law, these vital customs or morals regulate every sphere of human existence and give stability and continuity to the social order. Through the slow magic of time, such customs, by long repetition, become a second nature in the individual. If he violates them, he feels a certain fear, discomfort, or shame. This is the origin of that conscience, or moral sense, which Darwin chose as the most impressive distinction between animals and men. In its higher development, conscience is social consciousness, the feeling of the individual that he belongs to a group and owes it some measure of loyalty and consideration. Morality is the cooperation of the part with the whole, and of each group with some larger whole. Civilization, of course, would be impossible without it. 1. Marriage. The meaning of marriage, its biological origins, sexual communism, trial marriage, group marriage, individual marriage, polygamy, its eugenic value, exogamy, marriage by service, by capture, by purchase, primitive love, the economic function of marriage. The first task of these customs that constitute the moral code of a group is to regulate the relations of the sexes, for these are a perennial source of discord, violence, and possible degeneration. The basic form of this sexual regulation is marriage, which may be defined as the association of mates for the care of offspring. It is a variable and fluctuating institution which has passed through almost every conceivable form and experiment in the course of its history, from the primitive care of offspring without the association of mates 
to the modern association of mates without the care of offspring. Our animal forefathers invented it. Some birds seem to live as reproducing mates in a divorceless monogamy. Among gorillas and orangutans, the association of the parents continues to the end of the breeding season and has many human features. Any approach to loose behavior on the part of the female is severely punished by the male. The orangs of Borneo, says de Crespigny, live in families, the male, the female, and the young one. And Dr. Savage reports of the gorillas that it is not unusual to see the old folks sitting under a tree regaling themselves with fruit and friendly chat while their children are leaping around them and swinging from branch to branch in boisterous merriment. Marriage is older than man. Societies without marriage are rare, but the sedulous inquirer can find enough of them to form a respectable transition from the promiscuity of the lower mammals to the marriages of primitive men. In Futuna and Hawaii, the majority of the people did not marry at all. The Lubus mated freely and indiscriminately and had no conception of marriage. Certain tribes of Borneo lived in marriageless association freer than the birds. And among some peoples of primitive Russia, the men utilized the women without distinction so that no woman had her appointed husband. African pygmies have been described as having no marriage institutions, but as following their animal instincts wholly without restraint. This primitive nationalization of women, corresponding to primitive communism in land and food, passed away at so early a stage that few traces of it remain. Some memory of it, however, lingered on in divers forms. In the feeling of many nature peoples that monogamy, which they would define as the monopoly of a woman by one man, is unnatural and immoral. In periodic festivals of license, still surviving faintly in our Mardi Gras, when sexual restraints were temporarily abandoned, in the demand that a woman should give herself, as at the temple of Melita in Babylon, to any man that solicited her before she would be allowed to marry, in the custom of wife-lending, so essential to many primitive codes of hospitality, and in the jus primae noctis, or rite of the first night, by which in early feudal Europe the lord of the manor, perhaps representing the ancient rites of the tribe, occasionally deflowered the bride before the bridegroom was allowed to consummate the marriage. A variety of tentative unions gradually took the place of indiscriminate relations. Among the Orang Sakai of Malacca, a girl remained for a time with each man of the tribe, passing from one to another until she had made the rounds. Then she began again. Among the Yakuts of Siberia, the Botokudos of South Africa, the lower classes of Tibet, and many other peoples, marriage was quite experimental and could be ended at the will of either party with no reasons given or required. Among the Bushmen, any disagreement sufficed to end a union, and new connections could immediately be found for both. Among the Damaras, according to Sir Francis Galton, the spouse was changed almost weekly, and I seldom knew without inquiry who the pro-tempore husband of each lady was at any particular time. Among the Baila, women are bandied about from man to man, and of their own accord leave one husband for another. Young women, scarcely out of their teens, often have had four or five husbands, all still living. The original word for marriage in Hawaii meant to try. Among the Tahitians, a century ago, unions were free and dissoluble at will, so long as there were no children. If a child came, the parents might destroy it without social reproach, or the couple might rear the child and enter into a more permanent relation. The man pledged his support to the woman in return for the burden of parental care that she now assumed. Marco Polo writes of a Central Asiatic tribe inhabiting Pain, now Korea, in the 13th century. If a married man goes to a distance from home to be absent 20 days, his wife has a right, if she is so inclined, to take another husband, and the men on the same principle marry wherever they happen to reside. So old are the latest innovations in marriage and morals. Letourneau said of marriage that every possible experiment compatible with the duration of savage or barbarian societies has been tried, or is still practiced, amongst various races without the least thought of the moral ideas generally prevailing in Europe. In addition to experiments in permanence, there were experiments in relationship. In a few cases we find group marriage, by which a number of men belonging to one group married collectively a number of women belonging to another group. In Tibet, for example, it was the custom of a group of brothers to marry a group of sisters, and for the two groups to practice sexual communism between them, each of the men cohabiting with each of the women. Caesar reported a similar custom in ancient Britain. Survivals of it appear in the Leveret, a custom existing among the early Jews and other ancient peoples, by which a man was obligated to marry his brother's widow. 
This was the rule that so irked Onan. What was it that led men to replace the semi-promiscuity of primitive society with individual marriage? Since in a great majority of nature peoples there are few if any restraints on premarital relations, it is obvious that physical desire does not give rise to the institution of marriage. For marriage, with its restrictions and psychological irritations, could not possibly compete with sexual communism as a mode of satisfying the erotic propensities of men. Nor could the individual establishment offer at the outset any mode of rearing children that would be obviously superior to their rearing by the mother, her family, and the clan. Some powerful economic motives must have favored the evolution of marriage. In all probability, for again we must remind ourselves how little we really know of origins, these motives were connected with the rising institution of property. Individual marriage came through the desire of the male to have cheap slaves and to avoid bequeathing his property to other men's children. Polygamy, or the marriage of one person to several mates, appears here and there in the form of polyandry, the marriage of one woman to several men, as among the Todas and some tribes of Tibet. The custom may still be found where males outnumber females considerably. But this custom soon falls prey to the conquering male, and polygamy has come to mean for us usually what would more strictly be called polygyny, the possession of several wives by one man. Medieval theologians thought that Mohammed had invented polygamy, but it antedated Islam by some years, being the prevailing mode of marriage in the primitive world. Many causes conspired to make it general. In early society, because of hunting and war, the life of the male is more violent and dangerous, and the death rate of men is higher than that of women. The consequent excess of women compels a choice between polygamy and the barren celibacy of a minority of women. But such celibacy is intolerable to peoples who require a high birth rate to make up for a high death rate, and who therefore scorn the mateless and childless woman. Again, men like variety. As the Negroes of Angola expressed it, they were not able to eat always of the same dish. Also, men like youth in their mates, and women age rapidly in primitive communities. The women themselves often favored polygamy. It permitted them to nurse their children longer, and therefore to reduce the frequency of motherhood, without interfering with the erotic and philoprogenitive inclinations of the male. Sometimes the first wife, burdened with toil, helped her husband to secure an additional wife so that her burden might be shared, and additional children might raise the productive power and the wealth of the family. Children were economic assets, and men invested in wives in order to draw children from them like interest. In the patriarchal system, wives and children were in effect the slaves of the man. The more a man had of them, the richer he was. The poor man practiced monogamy, but he looked upon it as a shameful condition, from which some day he would rise to the respected position of a polygamous male. Doubtless polygamy was well adapted to the marital needs of a primitive society in which women outnumbered men. It had a eugenic value superior to that of contemporary monogamy. For whereas in modern society the most able and prudent men marry latest and have least children, under polygamy the most able men presumably secured the best mates and had most children. Hence polygamy has survived among practically all nature peoples, even among the majority of civilized mankind. Only in our day has it begun to die in the Orient. Certain conditions, however, militated against it. The decrease in danger and violence, consequent upon a settled agricultural life, brought the sexes towards an approximate numerical equality, and under these circumstances open polygamy, even in primitive societies, became the privilege of the prosperous minority. The mass of the peoples practiced a monogamy, tempered with adultery, while another minority of willing or regretful celibates balanced the polygamy of the rich. Jealousy in the male and possessiveness in the female entered into the situation more effectively as the sexes approximated in number. For where the strong could not have a multiplicity of wives except by taking the actual or potential wives of other men, and by, in some cases, offending their own, polygamy became a difficult matter which only the cleverest could manage. As property accumulated and men were loath to scatter it in small bequests, it became desirable to differentiate wives into chief wife and concubines so that only the children of the former should share the legacy. This remained the status of marriage in Asia until our own generation. Gradually the chief wife became the only wife, the concubines became kept women in secret and apart, or they disappeared. And as Christianity entered upon the scene, monogamy in Europe took the place of polygamy as the lawful and outward form of sexual association. But monogamy, like letters and the state, is artificial and belongs to the history, not to the origins, of civilization. 
Whatever form the union might take, marriage was obligatory among nearly all primitive peoples. The unmarried male had no standing in the community or was considered only half a man. Exogamy, too, was compulsory. That is to say, a man was expected to secure his wife from another clan than his own. Whether this custom arose because the primitive mind suspected the evil effects of close inbreeding or because such intergroup marriages created or cemented useful political alliances, promoted social organization and lessened the danger of war, or because the capture of a wife from another tribe had become a fashionable mark of male maturity, or because familiarity breeds contempt and distance lends enchantment to the view, we do not know. In any case, the restriction was well nigh universal in early society. And though it was successfully violated by the pharaohs, the Ptolemies, and the Incas, who all favored the marriage of brother and sister, it survived into Roman and modern law and consciously or unconsciously molds our behavior to this day. How did the male secure his wife from another tribe? Where the matriarchal organization was strong, he was often required to go and live with the clan of the girl whom he sought. As the patriarchal system developed, the suitor was allowed after a term of service to the father to take his bride back to his own clan. So Jacob served Laban for Leah and Rachel. Sometimes the suitor shortened the matter with plain blunt force. It was an advantage as well as a distinction to have stolen a wife. Not only would she be a chief slave, but new slaves could be begotten of her, and these children would chain her to her slavery. Such marriage by capture, though not the rule, occurred sporadically in the primitive world. Among the North American Indians, the women were included in the spoils of war, and this happened so frequently that in some tribes the husbands and their wives spoke mutually unintelligible languages. The Slavs of Russia and Serbia practiced occasional marriage by capture until the last century. Vestiges of it remain in the custom of simulating the capture of the bride by the groom in certain wedding ceremonies. All in all, it was a logical aspect of the almost incessant war of the tribes, and a logical starting point for that eternal war of the sexes, whose only truces are brief nocturnes and dreamless sleep. As wealth grew, it became more convenient to offer the father a substantial present or a sum of money for his daughter rather than serve for her in an alien clan or risk the violence and feuds that might come of marriage by capture. Consequently, marriage by purchase and parental arrangement was the rule in early societies. Transition forms occur, the Melanesians sometimes stole their wives, but made the theft legal by a later payment to her family. Among some natives of New Guinea, the man abducted the girl, and then, while he and she were in hiding, commissioned his friends to bargain with her father over a purchase price. The ease with which moral indignation in these matters might be financially appeased is illuminating. A Maori mother, wailing loudly, bitterly cursed the youth who had eloped with her daughter until he presented her with a blanket. That was all I wanted, she said. I only wanted to get a blanket, and therefore made this noise. Usually, the bride cost more than a blanket. Among the Hottentots, her price was an ox or a cow. Among the crew, three cows and a sheep. Among the Kaffirs, six to thirty head of cattle, depending upon the rank of the girl's family. And among the Togos, sixteen dollars cash and six dollars in goods. Marriage by purchase prevails throughout primitive Africa and is still a normal institution in China and Japan. It flourished in ancient India and Judea and in pre-Columbian Central America and Peru. Instances of it occur in Europe today. It is a natural development of patriarchal institutions. The father owns the daughter and may dispose of her within broad limits as he sees fit. The Orinoco Indians expressed the matter by saying that the suitor should pay the father for rearing the girl for his use. Sometimes the girl was exhibited to potential suitors in a bride show. So among the Somalis, the bride, richly caparisoned, was led about on horseback or on foot in an atmosphere heavily perfumed to stir the suitors to a handsome price. There is no record of women objecting to marriage by purchase. On the contrary, they took keen pride in the sums paid for them and scorned the woman who gave herself in marriage without a price. They believed that in a love match the villainous male was getting too much for nothing. On the other hand, it was usual for the father to acknowledge the bridegroom's payment with a return gift, which, as time went on, approximated more and more in value to the sum offered for the bride. Rich fathers, anxious to smooth the way for their daughters, gradually enlarged these gifts until the institution of the dowry took form and the purchase of the husband by the father replaced or accompanied the purchase of the wife by the suitor. In all these forms and varieties of marriage, there is hardly a trace of romantic love. We find a few cases of love marriages among the Papuans of New Guinea. Among other primitive peoples, we come upon instances of love in the sense of mutual devotion rather than mutual need, but usually these attachments have nothing to do with marriage. In simple days, men married for cheap labor, profitable parentage, and regular meals. 
In Yoruba, says Lander, marriage is celebrated by the natives as unconcernedly as possible. A man thinks as little of taking a wife as of cutting an ear of corn. Affection is altogether out of the question. Since premarital relations are abundant in primitive society, passion is not dammed up by denial and seldom affects the choice of a wife. For the same reason, the absence of delay between desire and fulfillment, no time is given for that brooding introversion of frustrated and therefore idealizing passion which is usually the source of youthful romantic love. Such love is reserved for developed civilizations in which morals have raised barriers against desire and the growth of wealth has enabled some men to afford and some women to provide the luxuries and delicacies of romance. Primitive peoples are too poor to be romantic. One rarely finds love poetry in their songs. When the missionaries translated the Bible into the language of the Algonquins, they could discover no native equivalent for the word love. The Hottentots are described as cold and indifferent to one another in marriage. On the Gold Coast, not even the appearance of affection exists between husband and wife, and it is the same in primitive Australia. I asked Baba, said Kaye, speaking of a Senegal Negro, why he did not sometimes make merry with his wives. He replied that if he did, he should not be able to manage them. An Australian native, asked why he wished to marry, answered honestly that he wanted a wife to secure food, water, and wood for him, and to carry his belongings on the march. The kiss, which seems so indispensable to America, is quite unknown to primitive peoples, or known only to be scorned. In general, the savage takes his sex philosophically, with hardly more of metaphysical or theological misgiving than the animal. He does not brood over it or fly into a passion with it. It is as much a matter of course with him as his food. He makes no pretense to idealistic motives. Marriage is never a sacrament with him, and seldom an affair of lavish ceremony. It is frankly a commercial transaction. It never occurs to him to be ashamed that he subordinates emotional to practical considerations in choosing his mate. He would rather be ashamed of the opposite, and would demand of us, if he were as immodest as we are, some explanation of our custom of binding a man and a woman together almost for life, because sexual desire has chained them for a moment with its lightning. The primitive male looked upon marriage in terms not of sexual license, but of economic cooperation. He expected the woman, and the woman expected herself, to be not so much gracious and beautiful, though he appreciated these qualities in her, as useful and industrious. She was to be an economic asset rather than a total loss, otherwise the matter-of-fact savage would never have thought of marriage at all. Marriage was a profitable partnership, not a private debauch. It was a way whereby a man and a woman working together might be more prosperous than if each worked alone. Wherever in the history of civilization woman has ceased to be an economic asset in marriage, marriage has decayed, and sometimes civilization has decayed with it. 2. Sexual Morality Premarital relations, prostitution, chastity, virginity, the double standard, modesty, the relativity of morals, the biological role of modesty, adultery, divorce, abortion, infanticide, childhood, the individual. The greatest task of morals is always sexual regulation, for the reproductive instinct creates problems not only within marriage, but before and after it, and threatens at any moment to disturb social order with its persistence, its intensity, its scorn of law, and its perversions. The first problem concerns premarital relations. Shall they be restricted or free? Even among animals, sex is not quite unrestrained. The rejection of the male by the female, except in periods of rut, reduces sex to a much more modest role in the animal world than it occupies in our own lecherous species. As Beaumarchais put it, man differs from the animal in eating without being hungry, drinking without being thirsty, and making love at all seasons. Among primitive peoples, we find some analog or converse of animal restrictions in the taboo placed upon relations with a woman in her menstrual period. With this general exception, premarital intercourse is left for the most part free in the simplest societies. Among the North American Indians, the young men and women mated freely, and these relations were not held an impediment to marriage. Among the Papuans of New Guinea, sex life began at an extremely early age, and premarital promiscuity was the rule. Similar premarital liberty obtained among the Soyots of Siberia, the Igorots of the Philippines, the natives of Upper Burma, the Kaffirs and Bushmen of Africa, the tribes of the Niger and the Uganda, of New Georgia, the Murray Islands, the Andaman Islands, Tahiti, Polynesia, Assam, etc. 
Under such conditions, we must not expect to find much prostitution in primitive society. The oldest profession is comparatively young. It arises only with civilization, with the appearance of property and the disappearance of premarital freedom. Here and there we find girls selling themselves for a while to raise a dowry or to provide funds for the temples, but this occurs only where the local moral code approves of it as a pious sacrifice to help thrifty parents or hungry gods. Chastity is a correspondingly late development. What the primitive maiden dreaded was not the loss of virginity, but a reputation for sterility. Premarital pregnancy was, more often than not, an aid rather than a handicap in finding a husband, for it settled all doubts of sterility and promised profitable children. The simpler tribes, before the coming of property, seemed to have held virginity in contempt, as indicating unpopularity. The Kamchadal bridegroom who found his bride to be a virgin was much put out, and roundly abused her mother for the negligent way in which she had brought up her daughter. In many places, virginity was considered a barrier to marriage, because it laid upon the husband the unpleasant task of violating the taboo that forbade him to shed the blood of any member of his tribe. Sometimes girls offered themselves to a stranger in order to break this taboo against their marriage. In Tibet, mothers anxiously sought men who would deflower their daughters. In Malabar, the girls themselves begged the services of passers-by to the same end, for while they were virgins, they could not find a husband. In some tribes, the bride was obliged to give herself to the wedding guests before going into her husband, in others, the bridegroom hired a man to end the virginity of his bride. Among certain Philippine tribes, a special official was appointed at a high salary to perform this function for prospective husbands. What was it that changed virginity from a fault into a virtue and made it an element in the moral codes of all the higher civilizations? Doubtless it was the institution of property. Premarital chastity came as an extension to the daughters of the proprietary feeling with which the patriarchal male looked upon his wife. The valuation of virginity rose when, under marriage by purchase, the virgin bride was found to bring a higher price than her weak sister. The virgin gave promise, by her past, of that marital fidelity which now seemed so precious to men beset by worry lest they should leave their property to surreptitious children. The men never thought of applying the same restrictions to themselves. No society in history has ever insisted on the premarital chastity of the male. No language has ever had a word for a virgin man. The aura of virginity was kept exclusively for daughters and pressed upon them in a thousand ways. The Tuaregs punished the irregularity of a daughter or a sister with death. The Negroes of Nubia, Abyssinia, Somaliland, etc., practiced upon their daughters the cruel art of infibulation, that is, the attachment of a ring or lock to the genitals to prevent copulation. In Burma and Siam, a similar practice survived to our own day. Forms of seclusion arose by which girls were kept from providing or receiving temptation. In New Britain, the richer parents confined their daughters, through five dangerous years, in huts guarded by virtuous old crones. The girls were never allowed to come out, and only their relatives could see them. Some tribes in Borneo kept their unmarried girls in solitary confinement. From these primitive customs to the purdah of the Moslems and the Hindus, is but a step, and indicates, again, how nearly civilization touches savagery. Modesty came with virginity and the patriarchate. There are many tribes which to this day show no shame in exposing the body. Indeed, some are ashamed to wear clothing. All Africa rocked with laughter when Livingston begged his black hosts to put on some clothing before the arrival of his wife. The queen of the Balanda was quite naked when she held court for Livingston. A small minority of tribes practice sex relations publicly without any thought of shame. At first, modesty is the feeling of the woman that she is taboo in her periods. When marriage by purchase takes form, and virginity in the daughter brings a profit to her father, seclusion and the compulsion to virginity beget in the girl a sense of obligation to chastity. Again, modesty is the feeling of the wife who, under purchase marriage, feels a financial obligation to her husband to refrain from such external sexual relations as cannot bring him any recompense. Clothing appears at this point, if motives of adornment and protection have not already engendered it. In many tribes, women wore clothing only after marriage as a sign of their exclusive possession by a husband and as a deterrent to gallantry. Primitive man did not agree with the author of Penguin Isle that clothing encouraged lechery. Chastity, however, bears no necessary relation to clothing. Some travelers report that morals in Africa vary inversely as the amount of dress. It is clear that what men are ashamed of depends entirely upon the local taboos and customs of their group. 
Until recently, a Chinese woman was ashamed to show her foot, an Arab woman her face, a Tuareg woman her mouth. But the women of ancient Egypt, of 19th century India, and of 20th century Bali, before prurient tourists came, never thought of shame at the exposure of their breasts. We must not conclude that morals are worthless because they differ according to time and place, and that it would be wise to show our historic learning by at once discarding the moral customs of our group. A little anthropology is a dangerous thing. It is substantially true that, as Anatole France ironically expressed the matter, morality is the sum of the prejudices of a community, and that, as Anacarsis put it among the Greeks, if one were to bring together all customs considered sacred by some group, and were then to take away all customs considered immoral by some group, nothing would remain. But this does not prove the worthlessness of morals. It only shows in what varied ways social order has been preserved. Social order is nonetheless necessary. The game must still have rules in order to be played. Men must know what to expect of one another in the ordinary circumstances of life. Hence the unanimity with which the members of a society practice its moral code is quite as important as the contents of that code. Our heroic rejection of the customs and morals of our tribe, upon our adolescent discovery of their relativity, betrays the immaturity of our minds. Given another decade, and we begin to understand that there may be more wisdom in the moral code of the group, the formulated experience of generations of the race, than can be explained in a college course. Sooner or later the disturbing realization comes to us that even that which we cannot understand may be true. The institutions, conventions, customs, and laws that make up the complex structure of a society are the work of a hundred centuries and a billion minds, and one mind must not expect to comprehend them in one lifetime, much less in twenty years. We are warranted in concluding that morals are relative and indispensable. Since old and basic customs represent a natural selection of group ways after centuries of trial and error, we must expect to find some social utility or survival value in virginity and modesty, despite their historical relativity, their association with marriage by purchase, and their contributions to neurosis. Modesty was a strategic retreat which enabled the girl, where she had any choice, to select her mate more deliberately, or compel him to show finer qualities before winning her. And the very obstructions it raised against desire generated those sentiments of romantic love which heightened her value in his eyes. The inculcation of virginity destroyed the naturalness and ease of primitive sexual life, but by discouraging early sex development and premature motherhood, it lessened the gap, which tends to widen disruptively as civilization develops, between economic and sexual maturity. Probably it served in this way to strengthen the individual physically and mentally, to lengthen adolescence and training, and so to lift the level of the race. As the institution of property developed, adultery graduated from a venial into a mortal sin. Half of the primitive peoples known to us attach no great importance to it. The rise of property not only led to the exaction of complete fidelity from the woman, but generated in the male a proprietary attitude towards her. Even when he lent her to a guest, it was because she belonged to him in body and soul. Sati was the completion of this conception. The woman must go down into the master's grave along with his other belongings. Under the patriarchate, adultery was classed with theft. It was, so to speak, an infringement of patent. Punishment for it varied through all degrees of severity from the indifference of the simpler tribes to the disembowelment of adulteresses among certain California Indians. After centuries of punishment, the new virtue of wifely fidelity was firmly established and it generated an appropriate conscience in the feminine heart. Many Indian tribes surprised their conquerors by the unapproachable virtue of their squaws, and certain male travelers have hoped that the women of Europe and America might some day equal in marital faithfulness the wives of the Zulus and the Papuans. It was easier for the Papuans, since among them, as among most primitive peoples, there were few impediments to the divorce of the woman by the man. Unions seldom lasted more than a few years among the American Indians. A large proportion of the old and middle-aged men, says Schoolcraft, have had many different wives, and their children, scattered around the country, are unknown to them. They laugh at Europeans for having only one wife, and that for life. They consider that the good spirit formed them to be happy and not to continue together unless their tempers and dispositions were congenial. The Cherokees changed wives three or four times a year. The conservative Samoans kept them as long as three years. With the coming of a settled agricultural life, unions became more permanent. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette.
Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.